Welcome back to Hemp Foundation Talks. This is part three of our three-part series with Clayton Turner. If you haven't checked out part one and two, I highly recommend it and we'll leave the links in the description below. To give you a brief summary in part one, we learned more about Clayton and his journey into the hemp space, as well as unpacked his brilliant cannabis extraction method. In part two, we took a deep dive into the value of the entire hemp plant, hempcrete issues, biochar capabilities, and on-demand energy systems to maximize processing efficiency. In part three, we will cover hemp batteries, waste of CBD processing, cryptocurrency for carbon tracking, and hemp bioplastic. Plastic. I have testing going. Now this plastic is a fully, this is actually kind of neat. I don't know if it'll show it here, but you might see a little bit of, uh, of kind of an organic look to it. Yeah. That's because this is a, and this is structural. It's not, it's not fragile, you know? So it, it, what, what it is, is it's fully biodegradable and non-toxic. You can dump that, but water will destroy it. So you got to coat it, but you can make a majority of that non-toxic and that's made from a milk and I'm a, I'm a vegetarian myself, but it is made from an animal product, uh, a protein and carbon, and then also the hemp itself. But that, so that's a hundred percent solution just as a demo to show people. Mm -hmm. However, um, we right now have a major plastic producer that is testing our system of carbon production in plastic at potentially up to 30% or more. And if that, if the testing from that comes back, like the way we think it is, then we can replace 30% of plastic, which is 1.5 gigatons globally each year, uh, and growing, uh, of, of cost of carbon to the planet. So taking out 10 to 20 to 30% of that and yes. then sequestering another 10 to 20 to 30% could eliminate 60% of that gigaton alone. And, and that could be done actually relatively easily when you're talking in the realm of millions of acres, which will take work and time. I'm not one of those, we're going to grow a million acres guys. Um, but I, but I am, you know, we, we are going to eventually grow millions. Corn is a 90 right. million acre crop and so when you look at once the offtake like these processes are there where plastic doesn't need to change anything right now let's let's go into plastic um abs plastic is not ideal people aren't that's that kind of weird looking plastic that you get you got that really cool formed plastic and then you got like that kind of mushy looking weird plastic and 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 you can take uh powdered micronized or powdered um hemp and you could dump it into that product but, but when you do that, that product now isn't recyclable. So even though you put 10 or 20% material in it, it, it can't be recycled now. The reason why is because they don't blow injection mold or do that with it because it will ignite. It will catch on fire. And so <laughs> it'll ruin your entire multi-million dollar plastic line. And when you go to recycle it, it will catch on fire. And so, so, cause hemp catches on fire. That's why we use it in our, in our, in our energy generation. So what we did is we already caught it on fire and then we made it structural, actually so strong that it improves the effects of concrete. It increases the hydrophobic pro properties and the strength and makes it lighter. If you think about a car, a carbon fiber hood, carbon right. fiber components are the best components you can get. That's carbon black, carbon fiber. So we can make the plastic a carbon fiber plastic and make it from a renewable resource that sequestered carbon and now what you've got is this blow mold injection plastic that can go into hot plastic and it can be recycled. And, and so I applaud everyone trying to dump raw hemp into plastic. It's easy. You can do it yourself. It's, it's cool. But I don't think that's no plastic company is going to be like, here's your water bottle that does, you know, no, it's not so going to happen. It's recyclable, but not necessarily compostable. Um, no, though this one would be compostable because this is a this is one of my 100% solutions. This would be like cement. But I will say this fun fact: when you just put the carbon in the ground, that plant's going to absorb some of the carbon. That carbon will go back out into the environment. It'll it'll right. find its way back out when the plant decomposes and so on. If you don't capture the plants, so mm -hmm. or if you till the field, it'll off gas from all those microbes. Uh, so the fun thing about this is, and and I. I can't prove the second part. So I want to preface that for people, but I want to use some logic here. So the first thing is plastic sticks around for a long time. doesn't right. go away, it, it, especially if it's buried. If you let it out in the sun and you let the kind of elements beat it together, it stays, it just micronizes. So right. if you can add structure to it inside of it and those structures have little oh. holes in them that can bind right. it in, then uh -huh. you're going to release less of those toxins into the environment. Because remember, 
carbon absorbs that stuff. So, so that's A. But B, you got to sink your carbon in order to get a benefit. That's why they pump all that CO2 under the ground with those crazy air conditioning machines that don't make sense that suck in the carbon and then do the process. So, so those things have to pump it underground, which by the way, if the ground ever cracks or something happens or an accident, it's going to get re-released and you lose all your work. Right. So for us, when we put it in plastic, that's actually a carbon sink. Because when it goes into garbage or the ground, it's in the ground and that's where it is. And now it's done. So, so now you're saying the parts of the, the plastic that aren't maybe so good, but they're going to be um, naturally sequestered, like decomposed. Some, some of it, now that's the part I can't prove. Some of it can be. But what I okay. can prove is that the carbon will stay in that plastic too. It'll be under the ground for a, hundreds of years, just sitting down there, not in a landfill. And that's good. Because A, it is a filtration media. So the more it, it's good as long as it's not, I mean, in, in our water system, right? Well, and that's the thing is that, well, the but, carbon won't hurt. But the our carbon water cleans the water. Yeah. You're making the plastic anyway. You're making the plastic anyway. So if we can make any of that carbon, the carbon is good. But we have to get the carbon locked up in something so it doesn't get into the air. So, so the carbon's good and we want to put it places like at water, uh, there. So in Washington, like your Brita filter at home is a carbon filter. Some right. of the best water that you can get is carbon filter. Cause you keep the new, the, the, the minerals and stuff in, in the, in the water. So like, if you just drank distilled water all the time, you would actually start to get a little sick. It, it, your body actually has trouble because we get minerals from, from natural water from aquifers. So that that's retained in carbon. Uh, and, and in Washington, what we do is we have these big, uh, we're, we're the home of wood, Two, four of the biggest, uh, four of the 10 biggest lumber companies in the world are located within 200 miles of me, uh, up to BC, Canada to Seattle. And so here we have so much wood processing that they're actually way ahead of the game on carbonization and these processes. So in, on the, the Puget Sound is a little ocean. It's not a lake. It's an ocean, but it's not an ocean. It's an inlet, but it's a little tiny ocean. And all of our cars and all of the Boeing and the fuel from, from the SeaTac and all that and boats and all the shipping we do and sewage, it all goes into the Puget Sound. And so it's, it's, it was getting bad for a while in the sense of like, we were worried that it was really going to affect sea life. So mm -hmm. what they did is they've created these big troughs that they fill with carbon at areas where water drains. And because we've destroyed our marshlands, you can kind of think of this like a marshland. It takes all these toxins out and before it gets to the water, it's all good. So, so it cleans out a majority of toxins before it hits the water, pesticides, things like that runoff. Mm -hmm. So you can do this at farm fields and other locations and so on. So, so the carbon itself is good, but if we can put it into other products, then we're trapping it so it can't get into the atmosphere which is what you know it, we're we're all worried about is the carbonization and methane and greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So, right. so it's a great way to turn plastic, which is something bad and sits on Earth forever. If cement's here forever, if plastics here forever, then we might as well take the carbon that's getting in the atmosphere and put it in those things so that we trap them forever too. Mm -hmm. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. I love how you um, you have the ability to connect things and um, provide some pretty tangible solutions on how we can solve a lot of issues and really how we can work together with others. And then even um, what I particularly like is your idea to help help the farmers too, and to because that also brings a balance in our in our you know in our system from from the poverty to you know, the imbalance that we have in that sense and how um, you were explaining before through um, capturing the carbon credits and how you can um, give that value back to the farmer. Um, maybe you can share a little bit more about that. Yeah, I'll use Africa as an example, actually, where we do a lot of work. Um, we've, <laughs> we've done work helping out um, Malawi and Zimbabwe, um, South Africa. So, so let's take Malawi, for example. Uh, and Thailand to a lesser extent, only slightly lesser. Um, Malawi has 70% of its GDP from tobacco. Uh, tobacco is not being smoked anymore. <laughs> the, the amount of people smoking has plummeted. And that means that there's destabilization and economic issues for Malawi, who has been the 
tobacco capital of that mm. whole part of the world. And so uh, they're, they're in a rough spot. But what they do have is a bunch of agricultural equipment. They have a bunch of farmers who know how to grow crops similar to hemp in a way. And they, and they have a willingness to convert to other materials. Now, those farmers there, that a farmer in Africa or Thailand or so on, they might make a couple hundred bucks an acre, right? So you got a farmer in America might make, you know, thousands an acre comparatively, you know, so, or at least several, several hundred. So the, the idea is, is that with our blockchain for those farmers in particular, and there, there's a two part to this, the, almost all the world's energy and carbon cost is from the developed world. It's from America, it's from now China, it's from Europe, and 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 these areas emit like I think it's like 90%. I don't want to get the wrong number quoted, but it's a significant amount. And then the whole other half of the world, they they don't do it because they don't have cars, they don't, they don't have computers, they don't have these other things. Mm -hmm. Now, those people have a right to modernize, they have a right to our quality of living. And I think everyone would go, well, should everyone in the world have it? I think most rational, good people would say yes. Mm -hmm. But the problem is if they do modernize, which is getting faster and they do it overnight, then we boil this earth. So you could have two ways of thought. Well, we better keep them from modernizing. No. Remember when I said we have to rip out all that old infrastructure? In a developing nation, you don't need to rip out the infrastructure. You're growing the infrastructure. You're putting in cement roads. You're putting in, or asphalt roads. You're putting in cement buildings. You're putting in connectivity with electricity you're right. you're you're doing these other processes and you're you're doing agricultural processes to feed everyone well the hemp plant with all that process that we're doing we have seed separators we capture the seed so it produces food as a side effect so you get food fuel heat your building supplies your roof your clothes it's everything you need you know mm -hmm. and it's solvents and ethanol and medicine it all comes from one plant and so with that when you look at the farmer in malawi if I can give him an extra $100 in carbon credits per acre, $50 in carbon credits per acre, validate that, then now I'm using that to sequester even more carbon. Now I give him that and now he plants more fields next year because he's getting this extra money. But imagine that token that's being transacted and can be transacted as a any other crypto token. Imagine that increases in value. The reason being is Bitcoin, Ethereum, Algorand, they've all increased in value. But they don't have any, in, uh, in the case of, you know, Bitcoin, it doesn't have any inherent value to it. It's only scarcity. They have this big energy intensive algorithm that takes so much energy to make a new token because they don't want you to be able to just hit a key on your keyboard and go, I have a billion dollars. Yeah. You, have to, you have to invest something. So right now what we invest is fossil fuel energy that we burn. And if you took all the energy that, uh, that, that crypto generates... And you, and you measured that against countries in the world, they would be the 30th largest country in the world for energy use above everyone in the developing world. They would have wow. they use way more. Yeah. And so you're, you're talking like a, a, a Spain or something is how much energy they use. And so it's only growing every day. Right. So our algorithm for our field, and we call it plant, uh, farm not mind, is... There's field one this year at that location. There's field two this year at that location. The inflationary limiter for us, we don't need to limit the number of tokens because the inflationary limiter is how many acres can you grow? And in America, for example, there's about a billion acres being used right now for farming. And we can grow about another billion if we put some work into it. So you have about 2 billion acres in the best case scenario. So when you're plotting out the inflation for this product, you can go, well, how much, how many people are growing hemp? And by the way, it takes time to grow hemp. It takes a process to do. And we're not just going to do this with hemp. We're going to do it with other crops too. But okay. hemp is the first one we're doing it with so that we can track all this carbon. We can generate these carbon credits and do this process with mm -hmm. all the plants that sequester carbon on the planet. But as they do this process and they, and they have these tokens, then these don't take a big expensive algorithm and a lot of energy to operate. These operate on a carbon neutral blockchain, Algorand, the first one, and we were with them before they were carbon neutral, telling them, you guys should be carbon neutral and here's how we're going to do it. And so, oh so there's so there's that. And then the, the next thing up is you've got this carbon neutrality, you're sequestering carbon actively, and then you still have a token with real money on it. So I'd ask you, scarcity is still there. Everything's the same as a Bitcoin, but you get all these added benefits and micro contracts in it and all that. So, so... I would assume 
that due to the scarcity of these tokens and their value to the earth and their value in cash, that people will want them. And they also actually have, uh, every time we transact them, that's how we get paid. We get a little token, we get a little slice. And, and, and by that, we take some of that money and put it back into the token itself. So the token will always have an anti-inflationary model built in, in addition to real cash and all these things that Bitcoin doesn't have. So because of that, we think that people will want these. So now imagine that same farmer who's got a $50 token and he holds on to it. And then next year it's worth a hundred. And the year after that, it's worth 200. And then it's worth 5,000. <laughs> Imagine if the farmers on earth, instead of crypto miners on top of a mountain in China, not near a big dam using all the green energy for crypto mining instead of for the people. Imagine instead of that one guy getting all that money, imagine mm -hmm. instead all the farmers of the world got that money. Yeah. Now, now if that happens... Now they can give away the food for free, can't they? We can actually make that part of our program. If we're going to yeah. give you this token worth five grand, you better give that food to someone, you know, like yeah, we, can actually, we can change it. So, so with that, and by that mission, we can now um, uh, clean the earth. We can value that. We can load money on it. We can, we can validate carbon credits. I, I just want to mention for a second, carbon credits are largely like 50% a scam and it's because of trees and I don't want to pick on trees. I like trees. I love trees. And regardless of trees, we need yeah. to preserve it. But as a hemp guy, I'm skeptical on trees. That industry has not been good to hemp. But in yeah. addition to that, let's look at the Amazon. The Amazon, according to 36 different major universities, is now a carbon net emitter. Now we need to preserve the Amazon. It makes a lot of our oxygen. Hemp can make right. oxygen too, but but it, we we want the animals. We want everything in the Amazon. We want people to be able to have that. It's a magical place, but we can't count it. Preservation is not is not sequestration, right? Mm -hmm. So so you're not sequestering just because you're preserving. And a great example right. would be anything you plant in the Northwest or California, anything that's a tree that you put in the forest, because it's going to burn. Climate change is coming. My, my whole, my friends were afraid of the fire that was coming for them. We lost so many homes in Oregon recently. Wow. Eastern Washington's a mess. California is always on fire every season yeah. and it just gets worse. So you have mm -hmm. all these people planting more trees because they want carbon credits. So let's put trees in it. Yeah. And then no forest management <laughs> at all because there's no budget for it. And now it's a big tinderbox that you've created. And trees take 20 years to grow. You can get the same biomass as a rainforest, which, by the way, I live by one of the only ones in America. So I know what a rainforest looks like. And 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 that that actually hemp will grow even more biomass. And it'll do it each season. So with a with a with a carbon credit, they talk about retiring. You need to retire the the land. It's going to be a hundred years before we need to that land. No forest in America right now. The the redwoods burn. There's no forest in America going to last a hundred years. It's going to go right back into the atmosphere. But when you take this carbon and you carbonize it every season and you put it in the ground, what happens is on a forest that acreage is used for that for a hundred years unless it burns or gets chopped down. And in our system. We chop it down immediately. We grow it, we chop it, we burn it, we capture the energy, we use the energy, we capture so the it's, gas. So it's a moving system and naturally aerating the soil and keeping uh -huh. things going versus like a swamp, like you're saying in the Amazon is creating more um, unhealthy gases because it's not, it's so like we can think that we're preserving things, but we're not really <laughs> having the good benefit. We need things to flow to aerate and hemp is such a beautiful plant to be able to do that. Rotational crop, everything like that. We can just work it right in. And right. because we're taking it each year in the forest year one, you didn't sequester a lot of carbon. You got a sapling, right? So when you're chopping them down, you're planting more trees, you're trying to do that, that this shell game and moving stuff around year one, you're here. Year one, hemp is here. It's, it's, it's grown 20 feet. It's ready to go. And then you do it again. And in some climates you do it twice. So, so right. you're using the same acreage like a, like a machine every year. So if you took 20 years of growth of trees, you would equal one year of growth of hemp. So hemp is going to sequester 20 times the carbon if you use our process than a forest would in that same period of time. And we're already using farmland and growing stuff like cotton and so on. So why don't we just switch right. it? And so I'm not saying don't have forests. I'm, I'm saying right. that yeah, there's benefits preserve of having them. trees that yeah. for a long time too. Yeah. Do that. Exactly. But save the wildlife, but don't call it sequestration because you'll only mess it up in the end. 
you'll you'll only muddy the waters of what we're trying to do and you'll and you'll ruin what you're trying to do which is preserve it because you're just yeah. taking random trees and planting them so so you're not letting the ecosystem just live and evolve it's and all it's, about balance right mm -hmm. i mean in the end it's all about balancing things it, it um, is processes and how do you measure in a forest without using a bunch of energy and people and so on. Each person that you employ to walk out into the forest costs 55,000 pounds of carbon a year just to live and wander around and do stuff. So, so you, and don't mention their car, their commute, their infrastructure, how you paid them. People are very expensive for carbon. So when you manage these things and do this stuff out there, like, you know, it, it actually adds to the cost of it. Now, each acre, you're going to scientifically have someone out there messing with it. No, they're not getting paid to. No one's going to. No one's going to monitor it for real. But in a farm, those farmers are out there every day. Like, What's going on? How's that growing? Spray that. Do this. Fly the drone over this. So when they're doing all that, we're collecting that data. We're logging it into the phone, and then we're using that data to sell to companies and provide to the public and universities um, the data that's the metadata of all of these plants being grown and best practices. And then the farmer gets told, you need to adjust your practice on your phone. They, they get told, you need to do this now to qualify for your carbon credit. And we can raise the bar as they get more money. Nice. We can tell them, you need to get new tractors. You need to get this. And then we can provide them loans through the system to get those things they need. Because we'll have a better snapshot of their credit than any bank. And doing we'll it in a, in a sound way too, right? In, in a processed sound way. So you're also limiting um, um, waste too, mm -hmm. right? So. Through the whole process, we could say, say, for example, you can't use these pesticides. And, and the farmer is incentivized to send their product to a green process. Here's how. I could take my hemp and I could sell it for something that does not sequester a lot of carbon, doesn't count as a carbon sink. And then I don't get carbon credits. Um, but I can sell my hemp to this biochar guy who's making, uh, who's capturing the gas and getting carbon credits. Now, when I do that, because they are both in my system, then that biochar guy, he gives a little bit of his carbon credits to the supply chain to the farmer. Mm -hmm. So as these carbon credits go up the chain and get sequestered again and again and again, it always shares back to the farmer. And where we did the fun thing to me, see, a lot of people are like down with the man, let's tear down Exxon, let's do all this. But to me, I'm like, let's take, let's get them on our side, right? So in, in my system uh, that we've developed with our system for the blockchain, the farmer he takes a little slice of his token, just a little couple of bucks, and that goes to the company that bought the carbon credit. Now, think of it this way. You go from a carbon credit that gets retired, may or may not be worth money uh, or, or really do anything for the environment, and then you take that and you it's done. It's now a dead item, a log of information that'll sit there forever and do nothing. For us, we take it and tokenize all that data onto the actual token. It, the, the thing you're transacting with stores all the data of what occurred with it. So you can actually know that your money is clean and who held it and what it did. So that goes to the companies too. And when the company holds a little sliver of that token, when it goes up in value, they might have $1 or $2 today. But if that token's worth 5,000 tomorrow, then that means that now they've made a profit by buying their carbon credits. They made a profit nice. and that's what I want to do because then they'll participate and to get that profit, they have to use our system, which means mm -hmm. I can track their net negative and blockchain it, giving them a carbon debt. And by giving them a carbon debt, we have a standing order now that they can allow. They can say, we're going to pay for half our carbon. We're going to pay for 10% of our carbon. We're going to set our limiter of how much money we'll spend at this. So you're not bankrupting a business on their carbon cost, even though some like oil should be. And you say, okay, so, so these guys are, are giving these credits to you and, and now you have them and now you get this return on the investment. And, and that means, you know, the, the farmer's not impacted because it's just a couple bucks and, mm -hmm. uh, and he's getting even more money from the pyrolysis guy. The pyrolysis guy is getting carbon credits he wasn't getting before and he gets to send his product on. And by the way, we're putting these systems in ourselves and intend to play by the same rules so that we can feel the pinch when, they, when we change the system. And ultimately we hope to create a board that controls what our carbon sequestration is. So we can always be raising the board. Mm -hmm. We could say, okay, now get biochar from your biochar guy, put it in your mm -hmm. drainage ditches to stop the, the runoff. Now mm -hmm. don't use these types of pesticides. Now we need you to do these other processes until event, we need you to give your food away for free. We need you to do this. Mm -hmm. And so eventually they're getting paid a lot of money 
just to be helping the entities around them and sequester carbon. Yes. And, and we're paying for it from the value of people transacting mm -hmm. on the on the exchange and, and also transacting at using it as a coinage. And I don't think that other companies would have a problem using a carbon neutral um, uh, token built on the back of MIT software that is ruled, like set up by a $9.8 billion company that's able to put all this into motion. Yeah. And that's and that's what's really exciting is that this is for real and, and we think that this is the key. You can't lose weight without a scale. As a guy who tries to lose weight a lot, you need a scale and measure where you're going. A forest doesn't measure where you're going and it burns down and it's not reliable and it's good, but it's it's not gonna it's not the key. Yeah. So so instead I'd like people to think about acres of agricultural goods that get sequester being grown and tracked. Um, because then that will also feed the earth. There's a, there's a cyclical way to create this economy so that money, food, living, look at your Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I know this because of credit, funny enough. Mm -hmm. they, in credit, they would teach you being the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, your food, your, uh, your house, your transportation, mm -hmm. your, your entertainment. You know, you, if you can get up into there, then, then now you're there. So, so ideally we want to do that. We want to provide the needs of people mm -hmm. and then create a circular economy, monetize it and put that money capitalistically in the hands of the farmer mm -hmm. because the farmers are the ones that, that can redistribute the wealth to people, but we're doing it with business in a capitalistic way. And that I think is the middle road that isn't socialism. It's still capitalism, but it's smart capitalism. It's, it's capitalism at its best. Mm -hmm. Amazing. <laughs> well, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you and um, to hear the wealth of your knowledge and, and in a way that provides sound solutions um, and looking at, at, a, at a bigger picture. Um, I think it's pretty amazing. And um, I'd be glad to, to continue to do this discussion and talk further, you know, um, as things progress. And, and check back in. But um, thank you so much for your time and for being on our, our show. <laughs> thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I'll definitely be back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Hemp Foundation Talks. Hemp Foundation is a nonprofit social enterprise on a mission to provide solutions for our current ecological crisis. Hemp Foundation and their brand, Uki, has created a value chain from village farms to the marketplace. Utilizing the many benefits of hemp to overcome deforestation, fight plastic pollution, and support regenerative practices to heal our earth. The foundation supports over 250 small village farmers in the Indian Himalayan region. In addition, they employ widows and women in the production of over 500 hemp products for the marketplace. From clothing, to food, to hemp bags, a large range of textiles, embroidered fabrics, home goods, and even hemp bioplastic. To learn more, visit hempfoundation.net.